but he competed. And he said, get into competition. It'll give you a purpose for a while to keep training. Hello, everyone, and thanks for your time today. You're listening to episode 22 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the best sparring gear on the planet, as well as some exciting apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. You can learn more about our products, like our universal face shields, at whistlekick.com. And you can learn more about the podcast, including all of our past episodes, show notes for this one, and a whole lot more, all for free, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, full of info, discounts, and useful martial arts content. And if you're an Android user, you can check out our Android app on the Google Play Store. Just search for Whistlekick. It's an easy way to stay connected with the show. And now for our review of the week. Remember, we read an iTunes review every week, and if we read yours, you just email us at info at whistlekick.com, and we'll send you out a free prize pack with a shirt and some other cool stuff. And this week's review comes to us from Dominic R. And Dominic says, I have not subscribed to a lot of podcasts as I don't have a lot of free time to listen to them. This podcast, however, is so great that it is one of the main things that I look forward to every week. It has opened my eyes to the bigger picture of the martial arts, and the stories are simply amazing. Keep up the good work. Thank you for sending that in, Dominic. It really means a lot to us to hear those reviews. And now to this week's episode. On this episode, we're joined by Sensei Katie Murphy from upstate New York. Sensei Murphy is a dynamic martial artist that I met at a summer event a few weeks ago. She grew up training in Goju-ru karate, but has spent some time in other martial arts, both traditional and modern. Sensei Murphy speaks openly about some challenging times in her life and how her martial arts training helped her through them. It's a great episode, and I hope you enjoy it. And so, Sensei Murphy, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor. Yeah, well, cool. This will be fun. Yeah. We'll have a good time. So, I got to know you a little bit out at Super Summer Seminars last month in Herkimer and had the chance to train with you and was was honestly blown away with with uh, your skill, but more so your the way you, you taught. But that ends my knowledge of you. <laughs> okay. So why don't you tell us and, and those listening how you got started in the martial arts? How old were you? Where were you? Why? All that. Sure. Uh, well, I got started for two reasons. Uh, one, my older brother did it. And, uh, you know, anything he did, I had to do. And secondly, it came right after a time my mother had signed me up for ballet lessons. And I did that for a few years when I was really young. And uh, come to find out I'm tone deaf and I can't really follow music so well. And the instructor, the ballet teacher, wanted to keep me back or move me to a more remedial beginner ballet group after I'd been there a few years. So I wouldn't be with my friends anymore. And that was enough to say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to do karate like Christopher does. And Chris was my brother. And uh, so I was about 11 when I started. You talk to some people in my organization, they'll claim they knew me from when I was like knee high. But I really didn't start that young. I, I was 11. Okay. So uh, I started in Goju Karate. Um, and I did that solidly for about 20 years. And that was my only style coming up as you know, a young child up through the ranks. That's where I earned my black belt from. And it wasn't until maybe 15 years or so into that when I made, um, after I'd been training black belt for a while, I, that I began to journey out and dabble in a few other things. And it, quite honestly, really wasn't until about three years ago that I've sort of uh, taken up with other styles and you know, goju is still there and I still pop into goju dojos from time to time for a class, but I'm not currently training in that anymore. What are you training now? Uh, right now, I'm at a awesome karate school, a fighting spirit karate, uh, where I moved to about a year ago. And they, they do a wonderful uh, program there. They have the karate program, and it's Kyokushin-based karate, which you know, my Japanese background just loved. And uh, the hardcore style of Kyokushin really appealed to me, as I also uh, uh, did Krav Maga for a while. 
but also they have a judo class once a week and a BJJ class once a week. So now I'm kind of dabbling in all of that and just enjoying it. Nice. It's a little. You get to play in different circles. Exactly. Uh, and I think that has really kept me interested. And especially the judo, I find it very challenging. It's different. It's new. It's, um, it's aggressive. It's throwing. It's falling. It's hard and uh, something I've never really did before. And so I'm, I'm enjoying the challenge of that. It's interesting. The, the subject of feeling inspired or, or maybe getting a little bored or tired of, of something you've done for so long is something that we don't talk about as martial artists that, you know, if you're, if you're bored in class, it's your own fault or, or something mm -hmm. like that. That's always kind of been the attitude. And what's been interesting as this show has grown and as we've had more listeners come on, people are starting to come to me and saying, oh, you know, I'd really like to train with that guy. And, and these conversations are happening. So it's really interesting that you're putting it out there that it was time Sounds like it was time for a change for you. Uh, absolutely. And I've, I've put it out there before. I, I, I got bored uh, at various points throughout the journey. When I was training in Goju, it was about the time I was in second year, third year of college, early 20s. Uh, I was really getting bored of it. It was the same class. I was already uh, knee on. And you know how it goes with karate. You start with a group of 20 white belts and, you know, there's 15 of them that make it to green and then 10 that make purple and five make brown and three of them make black. And then maybe one of them makes it to knee on. And so I found I was coming. It was the same workout. I was then helping the white belts learn kata, but I didn't feel myself growing. And I was getting bored of it. And I was at that age where my friends were out doing fun things and I was having a tough time with it. And it was one of my competition coaches, my mentor, who said to me, you, you have to do something with it. You can't look at martial arts as you just go to class. Why? Like if you really want to become an instructor, well, then that's a great opportunity. You're working with uh, underbelts. Uh, but he competed and he said, get into competition. It'll give you a purpose for a while to keep training. Now, I didn't feel at 20 or 21, I was old enough to be an instructor. I didn't feel like I had enough skill level. I didn't feel the confidence to be able to teach. I certainly didn't know anything as a need on. And I st started competing, went to a few competitions and was like, wow, you know, okay, I have a lot to work on. My first few competitions were not great. And it was uh, awesome to come back to class. And then just because we're doing stance drills up and down the dojo, that wasn't boring now. Now I had a purpose. Make the stances sharp, make them straighter, uh, make them more solid, get a little bit deeper because it was my whole point was to get better for competition. You had a goal. Yeah. You suddenly, you, you, your carrot was no longer just fitness or, or better for the sake of being better, but you had a target. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and that carried me for a good good long time. And about halfway through the competition, or just as I was starting to escalate in my level of competition, I, um, that was when I began to go train with different people or at different dojos to really begin to take it to that next level. But, uh, now I've kind of just recently retired from the competition and I'm beginning to see you know, a different piece of it. And, and that's this now element of it is try to become more well-rounded, try to learn a lot of different things and begin to make all those connections to put them all together. Do you miss competition? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? And everyone says, oh, you know, you'll be back, you'll be back, you'll miss it. Uh, it towards the last year, it became not fun for me. Uh, I, I enjoyed it very much. I and mean, the whole experience is just something I think very few people get the opportunity to have. Uh, and I started off local, did little local events and then did more regional. I did the crane circuit for a few years and then I did NASCA and I did some of the world circuits and the travel was fantastic initially going to all these different places, seeing all these different countries, meeting lots of really amazing people. But then um, it's very, very expensive and very, yeah. very few people get the opportunity to be sponsored. Uh, 
And I was sponsored for a little bit, but just my registration costs and my uniforms and maybe my weapons, not the airline tickets, not the hotel. The bulk of it. Exactly. Very few people get that kind of luxury nowadays. And, um, you know, I'm a high school teacher. So there was a lot of weekends where I jet out of school right on Friday afternoon, rush down to the airport, get on a plane and, you know, hope to get there in time for Friday night events, compete all day Saturday, fly home first thing Sunday morning, spend the day traveling, all of that. And then it's back to work Monday. And I never had like weekends to just relax and catch up. So the traveling got stressful. And the expense got stressful. It began to be, I had to win. I had to win. I had to win the money. Otherwise, I couldn't afford to do the next event. Mm. And I kept pushing myself and pushing myself. Um, and, th- and that's when I lost the enjoyment of it. It just stopped becoming fun when it became a job or a chore. Right. And so um, I know I really am enjoying <laughs> having weekends to you know, go to the beach or you know, just hang out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, those um I remember what weekends were like. But now we're at, we're at tournaments a lot of weekends now, so I I completely sympathize. It's you know, I did it all through my my teenage years and now I'm back at it. So it's interesting how things come full circle. Yeah, and I've I've done a few local events and I probably will, you know, continue to do some of the very small local ones here or there. Uh but, you know, and uh, I just started doing some training with the young students at the karate school I'm at now uh, to see if some of them are interested in perhaps putting together a little mini tournament team and just going to some local events. You know, they're, oh, they're, cool. they're too young to travel. But, you know, if that's five weekends a year, I'm happy. You know, that, that's yeah. fantastic. It's, it beats like the 30 to 40 weekends a year that you were yes. traveling. So I just... <laughs> uh, absolutely. So, um, so you've... You've been in the arts quite a long time, and I'm sure that you've got a lot of stories just from your travel and, and your competition. But I'd like you to think about all the stories that you have and pick one, your your best martial arts story to tell us. Oh, that, that is tough. Uh, <laughs> there's, you know, yes, you're right. There's a lot. There's a lot of those funny stories or those kinds of stories of, oh, well, this time this thing happened or that thing happened. Yeah. But I think my best martial arts story is my very first Super Summers event uh, six years ago. And it um, definitely, A, it opened my mind to like, wow, this is something I could get into. Besides Mm. competition, I can come. I don't have time to train in Kali. I don't have time to train in Kung Fu. I don't have instructors near me who do that sort of thing. Uh, But if I come to two, three, four of these types of events all year, I can take those classes. And then I've gained a little or added a little bit. But I think, um, and more importantly, from getting out of that was I met my husband there. And so to me, that's kind of the best martial arts story. I found uh, someone who had similar interests and similar goals and was as passionate about it as I was. And, you know, I found that special someone. We keep going on this journey, you know, kind of doing different things, but still doing it together. And that. That's great. And I remember, you know, of course, that was announced at the weekend this year at, at Super Summer Seminars. And, yes, uh, yes. So you've kind of given a t- uh, kind of glossed over. You put it out there. This is your story. So I want you to dig a little bit deeper. How did you meet him? Were you partnered up and, 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 and he, you know, you, were guys, you guys were smacking each other around or you know, how did this happen? Oh, actually, we didn't take a seminar until the very last one on Sunday. And it's um, kind of funny. Uh, Dave says, David is his name. He said he uh, noticed me uh, Saturday night at the demonstrations. I came in with my crew and I came in and I sat down in the auditorium and watched the demonstration. So, uh, you know, he saw me and wanted to make it a point to introduce himself to me. And afterwards, everyone was gathered in the lobby talking. And he saw that I was talking to someone he knew. And this someone... Uh, was a person I had partnered with in class. And we were just talking martial arts and he was asking me about Krav Maga and how I got into it. And Dave saw that opportunity to come up and talk. And so we just started chatting Saturday night and I didn't think too much of it. Just, oh, you know, what a, what a great guy, really nice, well-spoken, well-rounded, knows a lot about martial arts. 
And, uh, but then all day on Sunday at the seminars, I kept seeing him like over on the bench or over on the bleachers or on the outskirts or watching a seminar I was taking. And, uh, so he finally took the last seminar on Sunday, which was, um, focus mitt work. And, you know, uh, super summers events, it's lots and lots of training. And by the last one on Sunday, you are just exhausted. And so Dave had planned on skipping that one. And going, you know, going to go shower and pack up and relax because he was just done. And then he saw that I jumped in and did that seminar. And he's like, oh, all right, this is my chance. (laughs) So he took that opportunity and he jumped into training. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we Facebook friends right afterwards and started talking and tried to figure out how to meet up to train together. And then, you know, it started off as meeting up to train and led from there did you know did you know it sounds like he knew he had an idea uh early on did you no i didn't i just thought oh no he wants to meet up and train oh that that's nice okay (laughs) didn't think anything (laughs) of it until he was like uh because uh it's a good story because we lived uh, five hours apart so we Mm. um used to get together every other weekend go to different dojos to train and meet up at seminars meet up at tournaments uh things like that but uh you know he said after like that first time, he's like, no, I, I didn't drive five hours to train. <laughs> <laughs> I drove five hours to train with you. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, that, that is a great story. And I think for a lot of us in, in the martial arts, that's, and I know plenty of people that met their partners through the martial arts. And I think for a lot of the rest of us, that's the story that we want to have. So I think that's great. And I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So now I want you to think a little bit differently Mm -hmm. as to your time in the martial arts and its influence on you. How has the martial arts shaped you? You did have, I mean, not a full life, but, you know, a good chunk of your life prior to the martial arts, you know, certainly those formative years. And I'd like you to think about how you changed or how you imagine that you changed as a martial artist. No, that's a great question. And that was, it's a tough one, I think, for me to answer in the way that I've always done it. So and since I've done it since I was 11, don't really know too much before I was 11, what was going on. I you know, sure. went to school. That was about it. Uh, so having, having it be my whole life, it's always been something that's there. Trying to see how perhaps... Um, changed me is always kind of tough because it's not something I started later on. But in reflection, you know, I think, A, it's always been some form of exercise. It's always kept me active. So I think that's, in some ways, it's made my life perhaps different than if I've never done it. There's, I can't recall a time where I wasn't two, three, even four nights a week doing some kind of training. I just always have. I was never one of those never had a long period of time in my life where I sat home and watched TV every night. And I have lots of friends who, oh, do you watch this show? Watch that show. I'm like, Actually, I don't really. You know, I, I go to the karate dojo like three nights a week. <laughs> I don't sit home and watch TV. I, you know, and it wasn't until like the birth of Netflix that I finally caught up on something. <laughs> uh, but I think even just in general, the training uh, as I reflect back on it, I think the core concepts that I've gotten out of martial arts, uh, you know, that discipline, um, the idea of being prompt, being on time, courtesy, respect, self-respect, and the values that martial arts promotes has helped me in, I think, my professional life and in just being a, a, a good person. It's uh, kind of those values are instilled in me. And I think toughness of mind. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, there's always challenges when you're, you know, a teenager, when you're in your twenties, when you're going to college, and you know, you're, you're working eighty hours a week, taking lots of classes, doing homework, and that self-discipline, that toughness. No, sit down and write that paper. No, you have to go to work. Stop complaining. Stop whining about. It. Just do it. Uh, you know, just dig deep, you know, take a deep breath, do a kata, and go. And I, those sort of, for lack of a better word, those sort of things are what I've gotten out of martial arts. 
and if I could try to imagine my life if I never did that, if I never started with that first karate class, I don't know that I would have those now. Mm. You wouldn't have had them from ballet? No, definitely. <laughs> well, I don't think I would have stuck with ballet. Right, that's what I mean. I was going to get kicked out of the school. <laughs> Maybe you would have found them in lacrosse or and possibly soccer or something. yeah i did play soccer club soccer i did swim but those were those are secondary i was like yeah, yeah yeah you kind of did that a little bit here and there for fun yep so all right yeah so now i'd like you to think about a a rough point in your life something on the low end that your martial arts training was able to help you move past or overcome Oh, sure. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You, you try to think of a low point in your life, and just when you, you think you've nailed it, you realize, oh, that really wasn't so bad. People, other people have it worse. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the toughest point in my life was about 18 through 22. And it was because um, I grew up in a very uh, poor Irish family, lots of children. So I moved out of my parents' house when I was 18 and, uh, you know, had to work and go to school and pay for everything myself. And it, it definitely wasn't easy. You know, ramen noodle soup, was like, <laughs> that was a gourmet meal. That's right. And, you know, th that was really hard. If I had to go back and live that same life again now, I don't think I could do it working so many different jobs and you know making minimum wage and trying to go to school while you were doing all of that it uh, you know I think one of the things that ran through my mind when it really seemed like it was tough and I just couldn't do this anymore was if I could get through those three hour hardcore karate classes or those five hour testing weekends and those tough workouts where you know sensei's got you in push-up position for 30 minutes and you can't move and you know, your sweat stripping off your face and you're just trying to mind over matter, then, you know, I can get through anything. There was definitely times in that four-year period where I didn't have enough to eat, um, where I would go to the soccer fields at nighttime and grab all the bottles and cans and hope I made enough to get $4. If I had $4, I could get a loaf of bread and peanut butter, and that was peanut butter sandwiches for the next three days, and I was set, yeah. you know, and... Uh, of course, way too proud to call home to mom and dad and say, okay, you guys were right. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't have moved out yet. <laughs> right. No, no, I was never doing that. So I think that idea of that, that toughness of mind coming back to that, just, nope, you know, you're going you're gonna to get more hours next week. You just got to make it through this week and you're going to get paid in three days. Just um, And being able to accept, no, you can't go out and buy anything that you want. You have to, you have to save your money. You have to you know, be humble. You have to um, get through it and you will get there one day. You just got to keep working at school. And once you graduate, you'll get that real job. You just got to keep going. And uh, I think that was that idea, that toughness of mind helped me through that four year period. It's something that comes up a lot in, in this question on this show. And I think in general, when martial artists talk to each other about what did they get out of the martial arts and that mental toughness, that perseverance, whatever you want to call it, is something that's really forefront for a lot of people. And here, you're the first person to, all, to answer this question with less so of a, a specific example, you know, the, um, and not, certainly not taking anything away from past guests. Mm -hmm. We, we've had people that have said, you know, the, the loss of a relative or, or um, something more acute mm -hmm. like that. And here you're talking about a phase of your life, something that I think most people would not make, th make it through that four years in that state, you know, at that, that continued state of not having enough. Yeah. And I, I know it's, you know, I don't want to say it's like hearing sensei's voice in my head. Cause I don't know if that was the case, but uh, you know, when times are tough like that, I've definitely seen it happen to other people where, you know, you, you turn to drugs, you turn to alcohol, you turn to maybe um, 
self-destructive means. And um, that just never, it was tough. I didn't have enough. Why was I going to you know, waste it on something else, waste money on something else? But it was always that idea of, no, I'm an athlete. No, I'm a martial artist. You know, you, you just don't do that. And I think it was that some of that must have been instilled in me. It was never really a conscious thought of, oh, no, Sensei will be mad at me if he finds out. It was never that. It was just there, you know. Uh, he had a very famous saying in class, there's no shunting. There's no crying in karate. There's no shunting. And if he thought you, you know, were doing 20 sit-ups and he thought you did 19, you know, <laughs> he would assign you 20 more. Uh, right. He would say there's no shunting in karate. And it used to me, there's no shunting in life. No, don't you don't whine about it. You don't cut corners. You just do it. And, uh, Very well said. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's that's some heavy stuff and, and not something that everyone would be comfortable sharing publicly. So I thank you for that. There's I think there's some certainly some inspirational points in there and some teachable moments. And I hope people listening take that to heart, maybe even rewind and listen to that part again. So I'd like you to think about all the various instructors that you've had over the years and, and uh, take them out of the mix to answer this question. Sure. Who's been the most influential person in your martial arts upbringing? Most influential, but not my direct. Right. The sensei. Yeah. Uh, there's a few. Okay. I'm trying to rush through this. You can, you, you, you can give us a couple if, if narrowing yeah. it down to one is too hard. I, I'd say, first of all, uh, Chris Damon, Renshi Chris Damon. Uh, he was never my uh, direct instructor in karate. He was a uh, a higher ranking black belt that showed up from time to time. Uh, I was part of a Goju network, 10, 12 different schools. And every once in a while, a couple of schools would get together or you know, five or six of us would do a big promotion together. You know, there'd be hundreds of people there. And... He was the black belt everyone referred to as, you know, he's the, co he's the competitor. He's on this team. He's on that team. And, and that wasn't, you know, very well heard of in the Goju organization. So he looked up to him and was like, wow, no, he competes. And he was the one who got me into competition and, you know, would give me some advice about competing, where to start, what to look for, and how to get better. Every time I saw him, give me a tip on this, give me a tip on that. And if I hadn't seen him, if I hadn't heard of him all back in those younger days of all those go-do workouts, the idea that you could compete all over the country or all over the world, and the idea that you know, somebody from our little small school could do that, uh, I don't, that idea would never have come to me. And all of his little advice and help throughout the years you know, kept me going, kept me uh, competing, kept me doing it. I think, uh, you know, obviously uh, Dave, my husband, but before he was my husband, was very influential in terms of jujitsu. I did not have a fondness for jujitsu when I was coming up through the Goju ranks. I had tried it a little bit. We had instructors in class who sometimes would do a little jujitsu, mostly stand up stuff, wrist locks and uh, arm bars and things like that from a stand up position. And it was tough for me. And I was definitely at a stage, too, where I wasn't technical. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I wanted to spar. I wanted to fight, punch hard, block hard. Mm. I didn't want to spend my classes standing there focusing on the technical aspect of a technique. So I didn't enjoy it. And when I met him, he said, oh, no, I'm big into jujitsu. It's my thing. And I was like, oh, Oh, oh my God. It was almost <laughs> over right there, wasn't it? Oh, you do karate too? Okay, that's great. Uh, we can talk <laughs> that. And he said, no, you've got to come. You've got to try class. It's not like that. So I went. I went to his dojo and I took a class. And, you know, he's an amazing instructor. And I was comfortable. And everything I did, I got right. And I did it right. And it was a very different perspective that I got on jujitsu. And now I love it. Now it's easy. Now it's, it's not so challenging for me. And that really opened my eyes to a whole new world of, you know, the finer points, the different things you can do. Now you already know how to punch hard and block hard. Okay, let's you know, find a different path. Let's look down a, a different avenue of, of ways to approach 
uh, martial arts. And that was a big deal for me. Was it his teaching style or was it your motivation? His teaching style. Okay. I think the instructors in the the Goju network that I had had were very, very technical. And they were amazing. Don't, you know, don't take this the wrong way. I hope the listeners don't take it the wrong way. They were very amazing. They were fantastic at what they did, but they were perfectionists. You know, wrist lock, you must do it like this. The thumb must go here. The fingers must go here. And if, if your thumb was off by a little bit, you were doing it wrong. Uh, Even if it worked. It, yeah. Or okay. it was it, difficult. And for Dave, there was two elements to it. Number one, uh, pain is bonus. So if you're putting a wrist lock on someone, you know, the point, his philosophy, the point of the wrist lock is to lock the joint. If the person also feels pain with a joint lock, well, then that's great. But the goal is to lock the joint. If they don't feel pain, but the joint is locked and they can't use it, you've accomplished the goal. And uh, that was a big deal because jujitsu practitioners at least in my experience, have so much flexibility in their wrists and their elbows and their shoulders, they can go a little bit beyond what someone mm -hmm. who's never taken a jiu-jitsu class can do. And so maybe they don't always feel the pain. So I kept saying, no, that doesn't hurt. It's not working. And I, that was part of why I was turned off to jiu-jitsu. So A, it was Dave uh, you know, just saying, just lock the joint. Don't worry about if they can't feel pain, lock the joint. And number two was uh, just the class. It was encouragement. It was his his being a teacher. It was, no, that was great. You did a good job. And I came out of the class, and, and along with everyone else, of, no, oh, that, that was good. I, a, I learned something. I actually did it right. Come to find out I actually had some of the techniques from all those years, and that they do work. And uh, being told, no, you're doing a good job. No, this is great. And finding out that jujitsu was more than just standing up and doing wrist locks to each other. It, there's a whole field of it. There's ground workers, stand up work, there's mm -hmm. takedowns. It, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and, and it can be, and I've done some, some grappling with people that I really enjoyed training with and others that eh, maybe, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me uh, often and, and I'm sure you have this too. People will come to you and say, I want to do martial arts. What style should I train in? And my recommendation, I'll, I'll turn, kind of turn it back on them and I'll say, don't look so much for the style. Look for the right instructor for you. Because the right instructor can teach you with any, you know, it doesn't matter what the style is, you're going to get what you want yeah. out of it. And, you know, that's a great example of, you t you getting a complete 180 mm -hmm. in a style that you know you wouldn't have given a second look at. Oh yeah, forget second look. I would have spoken <laughs> out against it. <laughs> <laughs> Condemn. No jujitsu. No <laughs> bad. And yes, now I I love it. The instructor a makes a big deal. I think for any class, any style, sure. Uh, sure. it's an interesting uh, perspective I picked up from Krav Maga. So I started training in Krav about six years ago under Chris and Chris Dammit. And one of the interesting pieces of it, it's a very structured system. I wouldn't necessarily call it a martial art. It's a self-defense system in a way. But uh, just because you reach top rank doesn't make you an automatic teacher. It, uh, you have to actually go through instructor training. And there's three to six series of instructor phases that you have to complete before you can begin being an instructor and they teach you how to teach and how to teach different levels. And so I think having a good instructor makes all the difference in the world. And just because somebody makes black belt in a karate style doesn't make them a good teacher. Uh, and I see a lot of schools that forget that. They sort of funnel their black belts right into instructorship when maybe they would be happier just showing up to train and working out and sweating and having a good time. Yeah. Not everybody's a good teacher. Right. And I think there's something to be learned from teaching. I, I know I had a, a, my own school for two years and I learned more in that two years than any other two year, probably any other four year period of my martial arts training. But I have friends that absolutely hate teaching. Mm -hmm. They do it because they know it's part of their education, but are they ever going to have a school? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm in that point myself. I'm not, uh, 
interested in opening my own school. I had the opportunity to run my own program for a while. And I did, just like you, for about two years before I closed it down. It was when my sensei finally retired. We were uh, at a town uh, community center, town hall. And we met there two nights a week for karate. And uh, he was having some injuries and some issues and decided to sort of hand the class over to me. And I ran it for two years. And just like you, I learned a lot from teaching. And most importantly, I learned that I wasn't ready to teach yet. I did not feel I had enough knowledge, had enough background, had enough confidence in everything that I did to run a program. And it's and that was a couple of years back. And it's only now that I'm starting to say, hey, you know, okay, I think I got it now. I think I can do something now. But as a uh, high school teacher is my full-time job. I don't see myself um, opening up a school or anything like that. Um, it would it would be too much. Mm. Oh, certainly. I, I certainly understand that. And that was the main reason that my school shut down was I was focused on my day job. And by the end of the day, there just wasn't enough of me to give to my students and I wasn't going to half-ass it. Yeah. That didn't, that didn't feel right to them. But... Um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's some, there's some good stuff in there. You know, the, the, the circle sort of, of training, teaching, and then exposing what you don't know mm -hmm. and coming back around and, and reworking that. I think there's some, some good value in there. And it sounds like you've tapped into that a little bit. So that's cool. Yeah. It's, I think for me, it's finding out. Uh, what it is I want to teach. There was someone uh, that I met at Super Summers a few years back who gave me a, a or gave me some insight into martial arts. And he said there's three aspects to martial arts. There's the art. You want to study the art, the culture, that background, that history, the beauty of the style, the system you want to study in its completeness. And that's the art piece. There's the sport piece. Now you're training in it strictly for sport, competition, kata, point fighting. Or there's the self-defense piece. Self-defense move, self-defense fighting, etc. And he said the worst mistake you can make is confuse them. Decide what you're training in, why you're training in that aspect, and or what it is that you want to do with your training. And that will help you figure out how you want to teach. Mm. And for me, I didn't know, did I want to teach the art? Did I want to teach the sport piece? Because that I knew very well. Or did I want to teach the self-defense? And I hadn't owned that decision yet. And I became very torn every night. Oh, do we, do we focus on competition? Do we focus on self-defense? Do we focus on this? And wh where am I going as an instructor with this night after night after night? And I, I couldn't own it yet. I didn't know what I wanted my school to be or my program to be. And that, that was a tough call. Um, and I'm not even sure I'm there yet. So. If, if you had to pick one now, if somebody put a sigh to your head. And said you have to decide. You, and said you have to pick one. <laughs> well, then it would have to be self-defense. <laughs> Touche. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, and I don't know. Uh, I think it, Self-defense to me is just so critical and so important in today's society. I feel everyone should know it. Everyone should be exposed to it. Children, uh, elderly, everybody should have it. And running a self-defense type school to me would feel like I would be giving back to society or giving back to help people. But there is that whole other piece to it, that art to it. There is another element of competition. And I like the idea of uh, perhaps helping the teenagers who are starting to get bored see competition as a way to stay in the martial arts. Yeah. Uh, you know, if all of their friends have soccer tournaments and lacrosse tournaments and comp competitive type events for the sports that they do, it would help them stay in it, stay interested in it if they had competitive type events. Absolutely. So, but, you know. 
So you've trained with a lot of different people and you've, you know, done some, some different arts, certainly. I mean, we've talked about a few of them here, but if you could train with any martial artist, living or dead, that you haven't, who would that be and, and why would you want to train with them? Oh, very tough. Uh, I would have to say there would be two. Okay. Uh, first, of, I'll, let you, I'll let you have it. <laughs> no, have two. First, I would say Choja Miyagi. I mean, Miyagi was the founder of Nahate. He was the mastermind where all others came from. Yamaguchi trained under him and brought you know Goju Kai to Japan. Uh, others trained under him where Shotokan was found from. The founder of Kyokushin trained under Miyagi. So a lot of Miyagi's top students sort of branched off and formed these more well-known styles. Mm. And if I could train him and tap the mind that influenced all of these other styles, to me, that would just be amazing. It would, I, I would probably be blown away <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a class run by him or seminar or weekend or a couple of years. Uh, it, it, just to see what he had that influenced so many others. And if I had a chance to train, uh, you know, it would have to be Jackie Chan. I just, I love him. <laughs> cool. I love his movie. I love his, he just seems like he would be so much fun. And I mean, I, I hope that's the case. I've you know, never met him personally, but I would love to take a seminar or take classes with him because I have this vision that it would just be a lot of fun. Mm. And I know he's, you know, the, the stuff he does in the movies is stuff in the movies, but still, I think it'd be fun. <laughs> There's certainly a lot of skill in what he does. I mean, you can see it in his stunt scenes and his fight sequences that he does know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of core martial arts skill there. You know, just for me, the thing that's always telling is the camera shot is the person's face in the shot. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, it's probably not them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but his face is in all of his sequences. Yes. And he looks like he's having fun doing it. He's smiling. Yeah. He's, he's always animated. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what draws me to that. I'm like, man, that would be so much fun to take a class with him. I bet he just has a blast. <laughs> I'm sure. Rumble in the Bronx was that when that movie came out in, what was that, 90s? Six, Six. ninety five, something like that. Yes. Yeah, that was that was a pivotal moment for me because I realized because I, I grew up in a very traditional martial arts upbringing, you know, Kyokushin, Ishinru, karate, and that was the first time I realized how I really realized how much broader the martial arts world was. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Those are great answers. <laughs> I think all, I think some some of our guests get really academic, and they're, they're afraid people are going to judge them on that question alone. Yeah, I'm a little afraid. Some of their answers. People are but judging me that I didn't say Bruce Lee. <laughs> I I you know there we we have ushered in a deeper conversation about Bruce Lee, and uh, if you listen to this week's episode with Victor Moore. Um, there's about a 20, 30 minute discussion between Grandmaster Moore and I about his time with Bruce Lee. Oh, I'd love to hear that. So, I'm going to have to check yeah, that should, out. Yeah, go back and listen to it. And listeners, if you haven't checked that out, it's interesting. There are, you know, the, the martial arts world, people that were around in the 60s and 70s seem very, I don't want to say evenly because I haven't done, taken a survey or anything, but there are two very vocal camps about Bruce Lee's martial arts skill and that he was ahead of his time and others that say he was just good you know he was certainly not great and he was a, a phenomenal actor mm -hmm. and very little more so um at least a chunk of the listeners will not judge you for not saying bruce lee the, the other may judge you very harshly but uh we'll see based on the comments that come in sure. <laughs> that's okay which leads us to our next couple questions do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Favorite martial arts actor? Well, Jackie Chan. Uh, okay. And it's just, it's fun to watch him. I love all of his movies. Uh, and I love that he does most of his, almost all of his stunts. Uh, I, 
it's interesting uh, thinking about you know favorite movies, favorite martial arts actors. Uh, I grew up without a television. You know, my parents, my mom was very much. My kids are not going to watch TV. And granted, I was, you know, an '80s and '90s child. Uh, she, a very you know, old school Irish family. You know, she had nine kids, and we were not going to sit around in front of a TV. So we didn't have one in our house. We went outside in the woods and rode our bikes and you know raised mayhem in the neighborhood. But you know, we, <laughs> I didn't grow up with the set movies of the 70s and the 80s and even the early 90s until I you know, became a teenager and began going to friends' houses to watch movies. Yeah. So uh, some of those older movies, and you know, David laughs at me, I was not introduced to the Bruce Lee movies you know, until like five or six years ago. <laughs> I mean, I knew he did them. I've heard you know, famous ones, Enter the Dragon and, and yeah. such, but I never actually saw them. <laughs> You know, and some of the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, I didn't see those until I was in my mid-20s. So, uh, yeah. but I remember seeing Wesley Snipes in, uh, what was the one with the the vampires, the Blade. Blade. I was going to say Blade Runner, but I think that was a different movie he did. Very different movie. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Blade. And I remember, wow. Uh I like watching, now that I've seen the Bruce Lee movies, I, I really do enjoy them. And I like uh, the movies with uh, It's Man. Yeah, those are great. So, but in terms of a favorite, it would have to be Jackie Chan. I, I believe I've seen almost every single one of his movies. And some are funny and some are serious. But uh, Some are better than others. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Much some better. Some are. <laughs> good movies and some of them are hey Jackie Chan was in this yes <laughs> so you threw a couple movie titles out there do you have a favorite was you know did you mention your favorite in that mix oh uh, no and I don't know if this qualifies as a martial arts movie but I put it up there my top ultimate movie is Gladiator okay and uh, that would be a movie when I first started competing not so much the last few years I didn't have time for it but I'd watch it on like a Thursday night or Friday night or watch the segment of it. Cause it was just like you got a little adrenaline watch, watch a, you know, the fight scene and yeah. the tenacity and the fortitude that he um, portrayed in that movie. I just uh, love that movie. It's my favorite movie. I watch it all the time whenever it's on. <laughs> But. It's certainly a movie, you know, I, I don't know that anyone would define it as a traditional martial arts film, but there's certainly a lot of combat. Yes. And <laughs> there is certainly, it's, it is, you know, maybe we could say it's the, you know, it's a, it's a, an MMA movie, not really in the sense of MMA as we think about it, but yeah, you know, it's, you know what I mean? I it's kind of off on the, off on the side there, but it's on the, the spectrum, you know, what I've included. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Why not? This is this is your episode. You get to you get to answer the questions however you want. But what I think is impressive about that movie is is how many people find it inspiring mm. throughout that movie, and, it, and it's not just the fight scenes, but just that entire journey through that movie. And it's something that I hear discussed in business circles. People saying that you know, I mean, Jerry Maguire is a typical movie that. You know, in the entrepreneurial circles, people talk about to say, you know, I find this movie very inspiring and it's one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. But Gladiator is also one that comes up almost as much to say, this movie gets me pumped up. Yeah. And I, and I go and I attack whatever I've got in front of me. And is that is that kind of why you like oh, it? Oh, yeah. It would get me pumped up the, the day before a tournament. I get, Friday night if I'm competing Saturday at be in my kitchen floor, just like amped up, doing kata, letting it all out, and still be amped up by Saturday, and I get to the tournament and be all revved up, and kind of envisioned me stepping into the ring in a similar <laughs> scenario. Just I, I can imagine you in in your kitchen doing <laughs> kata with that going on a on a TV in the corner and and in i don't know if you have pets but in my mind there's a cat watching you very confused <laughs> not sure what's happening but uh, yeah i can i can get right behind what you're saying yeah when i used to live in an apartment i learned to close the shades <laughs> <laughs> and neighbors be like what? <laughs> what what is she doing 
<laughs> yes. Yes. And then there is one movie, one martial arts movie I remember as a teenager and I loved it. Uh, and I know now, 20 years later, I go, oh God, <laughs> I loved that movie. But that was the Capuara movie, uh, Only the Strong. Only the Strong. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't seen it in years, but when I saw it, maybe 10 years ago, I went, oh, <laughs> Oh, it's it's a terrible movie, but I, I did I did Capoeira for a couple of years in college and absolutely loved it. And at that point, even martial artists didn't know what Capoeira was. Mm -hmm. So the only examples I had to offer them were, have you seen the movie <laughs> Only the Strong? No. Have you played Tekken 3? Okay. <laughs> With, there's a there's a uh, Capoeira character. There's a couple of them. Okay. That, you know, have you played Tekken? And if the answer was no to both of those, they would I would just give up. Uh, all right then, because <laughs> they had, they didn't. Know. And I remember the maybe it was the second year, or third year. I was at Super Summers. They had Capoeira guy there, and I took every one of his. Yeah. I was like, oh, from that movie, I have to do it. <laughs> and it was so much harder than it looked. Absolutely, but beautiful. Really the people hard. who can do it, yes. Amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm impressed by them. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So if you didn't grow up with TV, I'm guessing you're a reader. Yes. <laughs> so how about martial arts books? Uh, martial arts books. My favorite was uh, the Karate Dojo by Peter Urban. If, if I could pick a favorite, there's, been, there's a couple I have on my shelf that I go back to from time to time. But this particular one, it's a little short stories, little fables that he put together. And during coming up through the ranks, at the end of class, we'd sit and say Zen for meditation. And occasionally my sensei would pull out the book and he'd read a little excerpt from it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those have stuck with me, just some of those little fables. And I like to go back through and read through them. I, uh, my second would be Shotokan Myths by, I hope I'm not mispronouncing the name, uh, Kusaku Yokata. It uh, highlighted or talked a lot about uh, some of the ideas people have about Shotokan. Uh, and, and uh, for example, Shotokan Kata. And there's a lot of, you know, you'll hear people get into philosophical arguments. No, there should be two key eyes. No, four key eyes. No, three, six. And he explains it as in there are two. There's always one uh, at your last move if you're coming forward before you turn around and your last move when you're going back before you turn around to face. And, and that's where they are. They signify the end of that sequence. Mm -hmm. And he, he set about writing the book from his point of view to dispel some of those arguments. Uh, you know, you're supposed to bow before you start the kata or do the kata, bow after. You're supposed to start, bow before, bow after. And there's a lot of different, uh, you know, those are those minor arguments that black belts have, <laughs> you know, after class or discussions, yeah, you know. Funny. And, you know, a white belt goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that to me was a very interesting book. So to me, it gave me that that resource, that citation, when I say, no, Shotokan Kata has two key eyes, as cited by <laughs> Yokata in his now, book, Shotokan Myths. Now you have footnotes. Exactly. <laughs> for life. Absolutely. And very recently, someone from my dojo shared with me Bruce Lee's Artist of Life, uh, written by Bruce Lee and John Little. And I've just started reading through that, skimming through that. And the message I've taken away so far was this idea of being like water, you know, going with mm. the flow, taking the form or the shape that you need. And I'm beginning to see that connection um, as a way of connecting all the different styles. You know, there isn't one solid answer to a martial arts application. There's many possible ways. And just like water can take many different paths down a hill, you know, so can martial arts. There's a lot of connection that I'm making with that book. I'm not through with it yet. Very true. Yeah, I'll have to, to check in with you when you're done. Because sure. that, that's not one that I've read. So. Yeah, sure. 
lot of good points in it. Cool. So what, what has you moving forward now? You know, you seem like a, a goal oriented person, certainly. Are there martial arts goals that keep you training now? Uh, yes. <laughs> I am very goal oriented. I have to have a purpose and I think overarching now you know, for the rest of life, I've realized how important it is to just keep going, keep doing something. I don't want to, I see a lot of people who, let me backtrack for a second there. I see a lot of people who get hurt, get injured, you know, not necessarily in class, you know, something happens, you, you blow out a knee, you have to have surgery, you're out a couple months and then don't come back. I've seen what's happened to people who used to train and train for years, you know, life changing event, uh, children, moving, different job. And they kind of fall out of that routine of doing it. Fast forward 15 years, the effect of and then try to come back. The effect of time away from exercise, time away uh, from doing that kind of activity, the challenges they have. And they'll never get back to where they were. Mm. And for me, I feel like I've reached a point where I don't want to lose this. I don't want to lose the cardio, the flexibility, the skill. And I know I just keep going until I'm 80, never stop. So, you know, I feel if I stop, it's going to be going in reverse. So that's an overarching idea. I have a small goals of, you know, very minor <clears throat> right now. I'd like to be able to take judo falls without, you know, closing my eyes and clenching <laughs> up and going, oh God, I'm going to hit the floor. <laughs> Be nice to you know, look like the way the masters do it. They just fly through the air and slap that floor like it's marshmallows. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, you know, praying for dear life as I go through the air. <laughs> I've heard that changes. It hasn't changed for me over the years. It hasn't for me yet, but... <laughs> But that would be my goal. I would, you know, and it's a good one. if I could, if I could overcome that little hurdle of being afraid and it's not so much hitting the ground, it's, you know, it's the, that moment of panic as you're, someone's putting Ipan Sayanadi on you and you're up and over and you're that split second, you're in the air, that, mm. I don't know, that discombobulation of your equilibrium <laughs> just <laughs> freaks me out. Yeah. Uh, so those are my my goals at this point. It, eventually, if it goes well, I'd like to see, I'd like to get involved with getting a little tournament team for the local events through our school mm -hmm. you know, to help keep some of the kids inspired. Uh, and we'll see where that, if that ever comes to fruition. But you know, that's where I am now. And, you know, talk to me in five years. <laughs> And I've mastered the judo throws. I'm sure I will have another goal. Okay. Well, I'm going to make note now. <laughs> Five years, i got to call you back. And we're going to see where you are. We'll do a follow-up. Sure. <laughs> so is there anything that you want to promote? You, you know, Facebook page or you don't sell books or videos or anything. So No. It's nothing, nothing to push there. But anything that you want to – any resources you want to offer up to the people listening? Um. You know that unfortunately, that's a uh, that's a tough one for me. I've never been good at promoting myself. You know, it was uh, Dave who set up a Facebook page. I do have Facebook. Um, I do have an athlete page from when I was competing. Um, and yes, I've already. We're we're gonna link to okay. that. We're gonna. All right, I've already seen that. Uh, uh, but even my own personal Facebook page, I'm not the best at you know, posting updates uh, or things along those lines. Uh, you know, it's, it's I guess it's a, a little fallback that I have. I don't promote myself. I was never uh, very good at doing that. I did it for a little while when I was trying to get sponsored for a competition. Um, Dave has been after me to write a book about you know competition and women in competing, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know that I would do it. <laughs> I think that's a niche that should should be written. I mean, it's really easy to put something out there these days. And if you do end up writing that book, make sure you let me know and we can make sure our listeners hear about it. Sure. And, you know, I, if anything, I'd like to let listeners know if anyone's ever in the New Paltz area and wants to take a class. 
Where where is that? Uh, New Paltz, New York. Okay. Yeah, if they ever want to come take a class, I love having visitors pop in. Cool. Well, we'll make sure we link to the dojo yeah. in the show notes then. Well, cool. Well, let let's wrap it up then. You got any parting advice for people listening? Uh I think if I could leave with you know one thing, it would be you know, keep going, keep training. It doesn't matter if you're three nights a week, two nights a week. You can only get there one night. You can get there every other Saturday. It doesn't matter. If you can only get there every other Saturday, that's two Saturdays a month. That's you know, 24 Saturdays a year. After five years, you've now... You still have something. You can still get mm. something. You just keep going. Keep your foot in the door. And uh, you know, don't look for the easy way out. Don't let excuses hold you back. If you have an injury or a modification you need to make, make it. Don't say, oh, I can't do this stance because of my knee, so I don't go to class anymore. No, just don't do that stance. Go to class. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, for that, that's right on. And I, I try to let the, those words not just be something I say. I try to practice when I preach. So I think that's what I have. That's and that's great, and that's a a wonderful place to end. I really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. You've been really open, and that oh. that means a lot. I'm sure to. Well, certainly to me, but I'm sure to also the listeners out there. Well, thank you so much. It's it's an honor. And thanks for listening to episode 22 of Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to Sensi Murphy for coming on the show. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would really make a difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com and you'll get a free prize pack, including a shirt, water bottle, stickers, and more. And we'll even pay the shipping. You can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show, or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can keep up on all things Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. While you're at it, Check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and more. And it's all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.